This is One on One. It was exciting to see what they did. I really enjoyed some of the dishes. There were a few that I absolutely loved that I want to eat again. What's interesting is they all did very similar dishes. So it is, in a way, easy to compare them. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have to do. Gail Simmons is a judge on Top Chef, the uh, video you just saw, and also the author of this book, Talking with a Mouthful, My Life as a Professional Eater. How are you doing, Gail? <laughs> I'm great. Great to be here. Thank you. I will tell you that uh, my wife, Jennifer, likes what I do, she's interested, but she was very interested then when she saw this book. She said, you have Gail on the show, I said, oh, yes. Thank you, thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, you have very loyal fans. You know, I, I think that um, the show has, has spawned a bit of a of sort of um, a revolution, of, of a liberation of people everywhere. Why? Um, you know, it's interesting. The show has been on now, for, it's, we're coming up on our 10th season. We've done two spin-offs. Um, you know, several seasons of each of those. And I think when we started back in 2005, when we first started shooting the show, we were really the first of our kind. Top Chef was a new genre. It's hard to believe now because there's been so many other reality food competitions since then, but we struck a chord with people. And I'm so grateful to think that we still are, you know, mm -hmm. seven years later, 10 seasons later, uh, one really exciting Emmy later. We, we have, we've really had a great time. Our, our, our audience really connects with the food and connects with us. And now it's this a pretty season special thing. is in Seattle? Yes, in Seattle. Okay, now let, let's talk a little bit about your background. Where were you sure. born and raised? I was born and raised in Toronto, Canada. How'd these guys get you? Such a good question, right? Yeah, I'm um, Well, I moved to New York 15 years ago, um, originally for culinary school. I was living in Canada. I went to college in Canada. I went to McGill University. And when I graduated, I had no idea what I wanted to do, but I None. knew. Not Who does, really? I mean, if you do, you're ahead of the game. Um, but I certainly felt sort of lost. I knew that I loved to eat. I knew I loved to write. Um, but that's all I knew. And who could actually get a job wanting to do those things, um, at least, you know, back then? So. I came back home to my parents' house and started living in their basement and finally got a job as an intern at uh, the City Magazine of Toronto. It's called Toronto Life, um, sort of like New York Magazine, but uh, you know, a really great monthly publication. And I discovered there that what I loved to do was follow the food critic around. And I discovered that there were people who do this for a living. So when I decided, well, this is my calling, this is what I want to do, the advice I was given from the editors that I worked with was, if you really want to learn about food, if you really want to write about food, you need to know how to cook. And I realized, well, that seems really obvious, and it's true, I don't. So I moved to New York, and I went to culinary school. And that's how I got here. Um, how I got on Top Chef was, you know, another 15 years in the making of learning how to cook, cooking in restaurants, working for some of the greatest chefs in New York, some of the best food writers, um, and finally landing at Food & Wine magazine about eight years ago. And about a year into my job, Food & Wine got a call from Bravo saying, we have this crazy idea for a show, will you play along, and will one of your editors come on and, and do it with us? And before I knew it, I was flying off to shoot the first season. Did you want, was there a part of you that said, I want to be on television? <laughs> Never. Really? Never. I mean, it's interesting, it really wasn't part of this, the conversation then. Yes, there was food television, but most of the food television, even seven years ago, even if it doesn't sound that long ago, most of the food television was home cooking shows. We're talking exploding, yeah. but not then. Different. It, I mean, it was just kind of bubbling to the surface. It was simmering, let's say. And then it really came to a boil with Top Chef. Um, we were the first people to show what it was really like in a professional kitchen. We weren't teaching you how to cook. Right. You know, there were plenty of chefs already doing that. Um, I mean, listen, we're PBS. We have a lot of great uh, cooking shows. The best. the best. I mean, you guys set the standard, yes. to be honest. And Julia Child. Julia Child, and everyone Jacques else, Pepin, yes. Lydia Bastianich. These yes, are the people the who best. taught me how to cook, right? Exactly. Um, taught us all how to cook um, from our couches. But this was not that show. We were not giving step-by-step -step instruction in a home kitchen. We were opening a door to the professional restaurant and to the life of what young chefs go through trying to make it in the industry. And it really caught on. I think it, it hit a chord with people because everyone can relate to it, but then there was this also sort of secret world that we were showing you. And at the same time, there was an element of, of competition, an element of contest. And so it sort of combined. You didn't have to be a huge foodie. You didn't want to have to learn how to cook to watch the show. It's you not just even really about compete. the food. I wouldn't say it's not about the food. I think it is actually about... Is it mostly about the people? I think it's about the relationships. I think that's why people watch it. Interestingly, the judges, me and Tom Colicchio, Padma Lakshmi, and our guest judges, we're there for the food. We judge on what is in front of us that day in that challenge only. We don't talk to the chefs. We don't hang out with them when the cameras are down. We have nothing to do with them or their drama or their interviews. But why people watch it 
is because they, they really connect with those amazing personalities, how hard they work, how talented they are. So they're really rooting for these individuals while mm. we all know about the food, which kind of lends itself to a really interesting um, crossroads for our viewers because we're just talking about the food and our viewers can't taste the food, but they can watch and, and connect with the chefs themselves. How hard is it for you knowing how hard it's been for you to be hard on them? Mm. Um, you know, some days are harder than others. I've never regretted a choice I've made on the show, you know, 10 really? seasons later, ever. Especially when you see someone literally breaking down in <laughs> front of you because they believe, yeah. they believe you yes. have just crushed yeah, their, their dream. dreams. I'm a dream crusher. Um, <laughs> not on sure. purpose. <laughs> not on purpose. Well, maybe on purpose, but not not, not uh, maliciously, maliciously, but because you're there exactly. to tell I'm the truth as you see it. Exactly. And what, what I think you don't always get to see, but that is certainly part of the conversation at Judge's Table, is the constructive criticism. We're not knocking them down for the sake of it. We're not yelling and screaming. We're having a really honest conversation about food, and we are judging on, on what is in front of us at that moment. There are plenty of times when a chef leaves earlier than I think they would have because I know they're talented. I know that they're maybe one of the best cooks in the kitchen, mm. but that doesn't mean that they excelled at this particular challenge, and we judge day to day, challenge to challenge. One more quickie before I go to the book. Yeah. Because it's television, mm -hmm. and because so much of this medium is about what we give off. Yeah. Even if someone's talented and they're good at what they do, a lot of it is whether people like you. Yeah. And they like what you give For off sure. or don't. How much of it is a product of deciding who's the more likable right. chef? Well, for us, it's not at all part Irrelevant. of the process. But that's why I think the viewer loves it so much, because for the viewer, all they have is if their person is likable, which is why they get so upset or so engaged with us when we vote off someone who they like. But the truth is that we don't judge on who we like. You we actually care less. don't. It's not even, we don't even get to know them. We don't even have a chance. What you see when the show is all put together right. is really, um, you know, their private interviews, them in the kitchen, them, um, you know, in their intimate moments, and them cooking. We don't see any of that. All we see are the plates at the end wow. of that process. So we actually don't know their background. We don't even have a chance That's to get to know them that well. So it's sort of this interesting dialogue. That Audience happens. is reacting to different things sometimes. Exactly. You're Absolutely. But that's um, what makes it fun. Uh, what is the most important thing <laughs> you want people to take away from talking with my mouth full my life as a professional eater? A few things. I think that uh, the kind of the impetus for writing the book was that I find myself in a, in a career that I didn't even know existed 10, 15, 20 years ago when I first set out to work in my working life. I found something to do that I love to do, that I feel proud of, uh, that I get to use my mind and my hands for. Um, but it wasn't something that I set out to do. And I think part of the reason that I've had you know, the modicum of success that I've had is because I sort of let those doors open and I, and I chose to walk through them, even though I didn't really know what was gonna happen on the other side. Um, so I think that the kind of underlying message of the book, whether you love to eat or you couldn't care less about food, is really to, um, to, to, to look a little closer at your passions and, and if there's something you really love, there are ways to make it a career and there are ways to be successful and to find that sort of um, that adventure mm. along the road. You talk a lot about the impact your parents have had on yeah. your success. Why? I think that um, as everything, so much of who we are is formed around the kitchen table. Um, what and was I, yours like? My kitchen table was pretty special, actually. My mother was a cooking teacher. She, ca she taught cooking in our home. In fact, our kitchen in the home I grew up in was designed as a teaching kitchen so that she could have people over and they could sit in this kind of huge open space and watch her at the kitchen counter. And she could teach them. She taught women in the neighborhood, men too. And this was sort of in the 70s mm -hmm. before before the Food Network, before Bravo had Top Chef, long before there was this sort of celebrity pop culture around food. So she was an incredible cook. She was a food writer. She wrote for the Globe and Mail, a big Canadian national newspaper. Now, your dad was doing what? Wine and pickles? Yeah, he wine was making pickles? wine What's and pickles. That? Isn't that amazing? Well, he's making wine. He's making his own wine in our basement. But then where are the pickles come in? They're separately also in the basement, in a different part of the cellar. They were two of his favorite things, and he had a killer recipe for both. Um, but interestingly, my father was an engineer. He's a South African immigrant. He moved to Canada in early 60s, met my, my mom in Canada. Uh, never even meant to come to Canada. Um, left South Africa to get away from the politics there, but actually originally moved to England and then was transferred to Canada as um, a chemical engineer. And 
so he had an amazing sort of appreciation, I think, for the life in Canada that was so different than how he was raised. He loved to travel. Uh, we went back to Africa tons during my childhood, and my parents really wanted to show us the world. We never sort of went on vacations nearby. Mm. My parents didn't spend their money on fancy cars or, or on flashy clothes. They spent their money on our travel and teaching us to eat well. And is I that, think it set the bar, really. I'm sorry for interrupting. No, is, not at all. Is that part of the reason, limited time we have left, you travel so much with the show. Yeah. It's a big part of your life. Is that why traveling is so easy for you? I think so, although I would say that the travel for our show is the hardest and the best part about the job. Um, we travel for, you know, I, I, for, for many of my jobs, for Top Chef, for Food Wine Magazine, um, I travel several months of my year. And I love it, I love discovering new places, I'm comfortable and at home traveling, but it also makes it difficult to, you know, mm -hmm. to stay in one place, to, to find roots. You know, my husband will say I probably travel more than he'd like. Speaking of uh, roots and comfort, your favorite comfort food is? <sighs> probably a big bowl of pasta. What I mean, kind of sauce or gravy? I mean, right now, I'm thinking of something a little fancy just because it's on my mind. Maybe some sea urchins, some chilies, like a southern Italian seafood really? pasta. I would go with a linguine with oil and garlic. Uh, delicious, too. Sometimes just, just lots of black pepper and Parmesan cheese is all you need. <laughs> I'll take any of it. I, you know what? Uh, my wife, Jennifer, was right about you. <laughs> I, she said she is good, and, and you're very likable on the air. Thank you. And you added a lot to the show. And well, I feel blessed. I, I love what I do, so I kind of you mind if I'm glad I get again? to have fun. Please. Talk with my mouthful. My life as a professional eater, Gail Simmons. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. That was great. Good to be here. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET Studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Hackensack University Medical Center, Berkeley College, TD Bank, Qualcare Inc., a local managed care company covering 750,000 New Jersey residents, the law firm of Gibbons PC, and by Verizon Communications. Promotional support provided by The Star Ledger and NJ.com, Everything Jersey. And by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association and its monthly magazine, New Jersey Business. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System.